Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am delighted to have Yasuhiko back. And he's talking about a topic which is very, very close to my heart and something that he has done all his life, autodidactic, polymathic spirituality. So welcome <laughs> Yasuhiko. Good morning. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So how, how do we begin? So this is the second in a series of conversation that you and I and your friends are having on new spirituality of the future. And so today I will talk about autodidactic polymatic spirituality as a second in the series of this talk. And uh, let's say, so why we talk about this? The importance of spirituality for the future of humanity. In the last uh, session, uh, we got deep into spirituality. I did the same thing with uh, Angela in her program about what spirituality is, and I re redefined what spirituality is, and which involves the awakening and development of spiritual intelligence in integration with intuitional, imaginational, intellective, and the basic, which means information processing intelligence. So it is a, the evolution of human intelligence, uh, starting from the information processing, which is basic intelligence, which uh, artificial intelligence can replace very well. Then you go into uh, intellection, which is uh, more involves uh, thinking and seeing the patterns and integrating a new form of knowledge. Then you go into intuition, which brings uh, wholeness to the totality that has been achieved by interaction. And uh, I forgot to talk about imagination also comes in the, in the same level. So there's the intuition, the imagination. And the highest level of uh, human intelligence is what I call spiritual intelligence, where you can actually have a, very intimate relationship with the unknown and unknowable in such a way that then the, the whole range of knowability actually expand. And uh, so, um, oh, I, I found a very interesting uh, quote by uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the famous uh, author from Russia. He says this, the intellectual is not defined by professional pursuit and type of occupation, nor are good upbringing and good family enough in themselves to produce an intellectual. An intellectual is a person whose interests in an occupation with the spiritual side of life are uh, insistent and constant and not forced by external circumstances, even flying in the face of them. So he is defining a real intellectual as somebody who has an internal spiritual dimension. And this is pointing to the future of humanity as well. That's beautiful, beautiful quote. Yeah. The, so the spirituality of the future is a full evolutionary blossoming of the human individuals into becoming what is called homo deus, the divine human, which has become possible, not in spite of, but because of the technological advancement that is taking place under the name of the fourth industrial revolution, which Buckminster Fuller, among others, anticipated in 1960 and 70s. Having read his uh, books since 1980s, I was aware of this 
coming of the fourth uh, industrial revolution, which is now taking place right now. Uh, I talk about this later, so we'll go back to this. But so we have a new opportunity for humanity to move into a new era of a new age of spirituality, which hasn't been, which wasn't possible in the past. But it is not a sure thing. It can go into a different uh, direction. So spirituality is important in order for us to move into the age of imagination and new age of abundance and freedom. And this is very personal to me. Um, uh, I have shared this with few people in the past, and one time in uh, an actually online uh, interview. So when I was 16, I had this, um, what I call spiritual epiphany. Hmm. And uh, it was like a downloading of uh, knowledge, <laughs> uh, which it has taken decades to unpack, revise, and expand. But at that time, at the age of 16, it answered fundamental questions I was asking about life, the purpose, who am I, and purpose of life, in a way that was completely surprising to me. And I was really, I was very happy. <laughs> but then I realized that uh, people didn't receive my happiness well in my school. Actually, they treated me very cruelly, violently, because we, I was no longer part of their, their uh, establishment. You know, I was, in a school for uh, an elite school. And uh, I was saying something, you know, what that was not uh, going against along with their uh, um, teaching. <clears throat> so I uh, begin to read, uh, skipping classes and reading a lot of books. And so there was two, two lines of uh, reading. I was most attracted to Buddhism and two lines, one was the Dogen, Zen. And Shobo Genzo, Dogen's writing has at least 75 volumes. If you add uh, a few other things, it goes all the way to 96 volumes. It takes a lot of time to read them. <laughs> and then there's another line, which come from uh, uh, Shinran. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, Shinran is the uh, Buddhist, master, originator of Pure Land School, which is maybe the closest to Christianity amongst all the uh, Buddhist teachings. And uh, I encountered a, a teacher, a philosopher, Shuichi Maeda, who studied under uh, Shindan School's master, Akegara's Haya, and studied under Kitaro Nishida in Kyoto University. And through him, I studied uh, Akegara's Haya and his teacher, uh, Mitsuki uh, Kiyozawa. And they all integrated the Western thinking into this you know, uh, Buddhist thought. And Akegara's Haya has written a, a essay called uh, Dokurushiya no Kyodo Tai Sengen, which is a declaration, uh, declaration of, for the community of the independent, sovereign, awakened individuals. He was presenting a vision of a new uh, spiritual community where each person is sovereign, awakened, individual, 
and there is no particular teacher guru. It is an internal uh, um, authority based spiritual community. I was very attracted to that uh, you know, way of thinking. And then, uh, as you know, when you go into Zen, um, uh, Linji, uh, uh, Rinzai, uh, Japanese, in Japanese, Rinzai, the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, ninth century uh, Zen master said, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> so those, Hayaki Garasu's uh, idea and the Zen's idea of, you know, uh, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill, kill him, was very close to me. And after having studied uh, Zen and Buddhism in real in depth, I came to India. And I had three years. I went to, you know, University of Bombay, as you know. And I have to restudy English and also studying Sanskrit in Japanese. And I said, well, I have three years, only three years. Maybe I should focus on mastering English <laughs> and read as many books as possible. <laughs> and I love to learn, but I don't like schools. <laughs> and oftentimes I was absent from school and uh, went to library. And when Christian Murti came, uh, I went to listen to Christian Murti, and uh, the, the owner of the home where I was staying in Bombay had a home in Pune. He was kind of wealthy, uh, wealthy man, mm -hmm. and he stayed in Pune more often than uh, Bombay. So I went to Pune and I, I, I realized there was a man named uh, Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, and there was a big ashram there. So I went to his lectures. Mm -hmm. Through them, uh, I, I, Krishnamurti taught guru -less spirituality, truth is pathless land, and it, you are the one who is seeking truth. And nobody can teach you truth. Yes. yes. Rajneesh gave lecture on every mystic, every scripture that exists. Uh, not only Hindus, but also Taoism, Zen, Sufi. And I saw, and he also given lecture on uh, Nietzsche. It was like a, he represented a new kind of spirituality in the sense of, you know, there's, there's unity amongst all those religions. There's a, there's a state of consciousness uh, from which you can understand every path and appreciate and see the integration. That was the Rajneesh's contribution. And through Rajneesh, I learned about uh, uh, George Grujev. And through, by reading Grujev, I also you know, studied uh, his students, brilliant people, P.D. Ospensky, J.G. Bennett, Morris Nicole, and from Grujev and his students, I learned something, which is, or well, Grujev was uh, immersed himself into esoteric traditions and understand many different schools. He knew about 22 languages. At one point, he was a tutor to uh, Dalai Lama. <laughs> mm -hmm. He went to Tibet to study Tibetan original, but you know, his, uh, Prophet job was to teach, uh, you know, uh, Dalai Lama. And then not only absorb those ancient teachings, he created a new kind of teaching. And different aspects of his new kind of teaching, his brilliant student taught, Ostensky, Morris Nicole, and then uh, J.G. Bennett and others. So, those three teachers are really deep influence on me. You know, as I said, uh, just before I left India, I read the Life Divine by Sri Aurobindo. Mm -hmm. uh, my English was good enough to understand his English by that time. <clears throat> anyway, so then I came to United States and I 
came across Buckminster Fuller and also studied uh, other things, including Bruno's idea. And Giordano Bruno had an idea of the universe as eccentric. You see, be before Copernicus, it was uh, geocentric. And after Copernicus, it was heliocentric. But Bruno was way ahead of everybody. He said, there is no such thing as center in the universe. This universe is infinitely eternal. So there is no particular center in the universe, which means it's also an omnicentric. Any point you point in the universe is the center of the universe. And the Bakumin Safura defines the universe as the aggregate of all humanities consciously apprehended and communicated non-simultaneous and partially overlapping experiences. Now, he makes the universe as an aggregate of stories, as a brilliant. And this is, again, it's omnicentric. Mm -hmm. So the original vision I learned from Akigara's higher turned into the vision of omnicentric civilization where each individual constituting this civilization is an awakened, spiritually awakened, intellectually sovereign individuals working together to evolve individually and together. So, the book I read in when I was 17, and uh, in 10 years, when in California, after having read uh, Buckminster Fura and uh, Giordano Bruno, it became omnicentric civilization vision. And having read uh, Buckminster Fura, I, I, I knew the coming of this fourth industrial revolution, digital revolution which will create an infrastructure for omnicentric civilization. So that is my uh, personal connection to this. And uh, one more thing, Ayn Rand. <laughs> um, Ayn Rand has written many novels, not many, but great novels and also many essays. One of which is, uh, is a collection of essays called For the New Intellectuals. And in which he, she talks about that uh, leaders of the future of humanity is the uh, philosopher and CEOs of business. I like that idea. And so being a guru, a spiritual teacher and philosopher, and somehow try to contribute to the evolution of human consciousness, I chose a business community as my primary target. Working with business leaders as a philosopher in spiritualizing business. It was uh, late 1980s and that's why I became a business consultant and worked on spiritualization of organizations. I don't think I have been extremely successful, but uh, uh, some people <laughs> got something. <laughs> <laughs> it is very difficult to do that. <laughs> yes. Bigger the organization, harder it is. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Now I have many things to ask you, but do you want to continue on your path? Yeah, I want to continue, and then then we can uh, get sure. into questions. Uh, Please, yeah, yeah. And uh, the importance of spirituality has become pronounced now today. So the fourth industrial revolution 
that is take place now, this digital, uh, AI, and all kinds of technologies that are kind of uh, moving in the direction of integrating the digital, physical, biological into one, that can free humans from physical labor that can create an abundance economy so that people don't need to be working to make a living will provide a freedom and space for people to really work on their intellectual and spiritual development is now stolen by a narrative or a paradigm which is called the Great Reset by World Economic Forum led by Klaus Schwab. And the Great Reset is an elite attempt at harness the advanced technologies emerging from the fourth industrial revolution to enslave the rest of us. So the technology that is distributive, decentralized, and uh, omnicentric, they want to use it to invade into our privacy and collect the information on everybody and then strike. So it will be a tyranny and total, totalitarianism in a massive scale. And so many people bought into this scenario. It's a transhumanist uh, attempt at usurping the advanced technology to benefit the few at the cost of many. The few ruling class enslaving the rest of us. So we need a great awakening. And each individual need to cultivate their intelligence and spiritual intelligence to achieve sovereignty and individuality in the highest possible level on the highest possible level and come together to harness the fourth industrial revolution to create the kind of civilization that would have been beyond the dream of anybody before us. And we can exploit that uh, civilization for our own evolution and achieving autodidactic, polymatic <laughs> spirituality. People will become more and more autodidactic. They will, uh, they will uh, harness their uh, polymatic potentials and explore the dimensions that is only possible for those whose spiritual intelligence have been awakened. So this is, uh, to me, an urgent thing. It is not uh, something curious and some, some, some group, small group of people interested in spirituality. So let's talk about uh, new spirituality. It is urgent for humans to awaken into, in this way, autodidactic, auto, autodidactic polymatic spirituality so that humanity can continue in 
freedom and liberty. So that is a, like a larger context of my personal experience and the larger context of what is happening and why it is so important for us to really look into spirituality and the new spirituality, which is autodidactic and polymatic, because the people are asleep in the same way that the people in the, of the Middle Ages were asleep. They believed in some dogma. Today, they may not believe in God, but they believe in something. Same mentality. Authority is outside. So they believe in this media. They believe in academia. They believe in this uh, great reset uh, narrative. And they go along with this. People need to be able to think and awaken themselves. So your and my individual evolution is important, but also it has a significance to the rest of humanity. So maybe we can pause because before I talk about polymacy and then autodidactism. Wonderful. Um, so I want to summarize it in my own way. Uh, what I heard for, uh, and folks, please keep track of all your questions. Try to keep your questions brief. We'll go ahead and we'll deal with all the questions. I got four points here and which really kind of, I wanted to highlight them because they're very different from how people think about spirituality, how people think about society. The first point you made is that spirituality is a human faculty that is integrated with all our faculties. Mm -hmm. And it is really the core faculty which drives other faculties and which is at the heart of who we are. Mm -hmm. And it is intimately connected to imagination, rationality, information processing, senses, action, society. So it is like the center which is going to, you know, which has all these effects. That was mm -hmm. point number one. The second point you talked about these four great teachers who had achieved a self-consciousness from which vantage point they were able to take in all the spiritual traditions of the world and integrate them. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to give you this canned version, it was a way of achieving a perspective, a standing point within your own soul from which we can relate to everything. That was the second point. The third point is the view of an individual as being spiritually awakened. I love the word awakened because most of us are sleeping most of the time. <laughs> the core of our being, you know, we are asleep at that level. So spiritually awakened, intellectually sovereign and free. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing that is stopping our mind. Yes. And it's in that order, it's like spiritually awakened, then intellectually sovereign, and this being the condition of many people, it's not just you. It is omnicentric, that this is yeah. a center that there are many, 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 many such centers. Mm -hmm. Each of us has mm -hmm. the potential mm -hmm. of being that center. Mm -hmm. That was the third point. The fourth point is about the current technology and the amazing age that we are living in, which actually makes operations of such individuals and cooperations working together of yes. such individuals possible. And the results of which, both at the spiritual, intellectual, psychological, physical, economical, political level are of a magnitude much, 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 much higher Mm -hmm. than what people like Aristotle, Aquinas, 
or Jefferson could imagine. Um, so those are the four points that that that. Yes, one more point. Uh, maybe you know you covered it, but you know. Uh, so we have an environment, physical environment, and we have also an intellectual environment, which I call ideosphere, sphere of ideas and ideation. Up to this moment, configuration of this ideosphere has been concentric. There is Buddha and around him. There's a Krishna around him, Sankara around him, Dogen around him. They have been, you know, uh, great thinkers and they become a center and, and they become an external authority and people follow them. Very few people, most people are consumed of ideas, not the generated of ideas. And because of the reason, ruling class can manipulate the mass masses easily because they follow they don't think for themselves and spirituality up to this moment has been connected to beliefs or faith in a sense of blind faith and new age religion is very anti-intellectual no, as Solzhenitsyn said, true intellectuals are that their spiritual urge is insistent and constant. So we need to really integrate spirituality with the rest of our uh, consciousness and the rest of our being. And actually, as you said beautifully, Without spirituality, none of those intelligences can be integrated. So we want, I, I want to see the ideosphere, which is omnicentric. And as many people as possible to become idea generators, not just consumers and believers. And that is extremely, extremely important because that's what's happening now. You see, people yes, I, I, I like to say, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, art, you know, I don't like, or, or in terms of sports, I don't like uh, spectator sports. I like competitive, you know, it's like participatory sports. Similarly yes. for art, you can't be really good consumer of art until you produce it. So life oh, is... Yeah, life, life is not TV. Life is not kind of consuming and watching what other people yes. do. Uh, mm -hmm. It is about living. Similarly, ideas is not about just taking in yes. ideas of other people. It is about you using ideas to make sense yes. of your, your life. Yes, exactly. So that's uh, basic ground. And uh, would you like to take some questions or would you like to continue? No, I, I want to go, go on please, and then uh, please go on. Again, uh, the, by answering the questions, we can cover everything. Sounds good. Go ahead. The, so let's talk about polymathy. We have an expert on polymathy amongst us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, from my perspective, for the creation and de development of the age of imagination, Polymath and polymathy will play a leading role. And one of the most uh, popular or liked, well liked uh, quote, my own quote from 150 quotes from uh, on <laughs> Facebook, I want to read it to you and uh, I can, you can connect this. So this is what I said. The ultimate in creativity, the ultimate in creativity is that which creates new perceptions of reality and visions of world. This creativity transcends and is more fundamental than any form of art. It is the direct participation 
in the creative process of the universe. It is the foreseeing of a possibility arising as a new future in the cosmic evolution. And evolution is synonymous with exploration. The more evolved we are in consciousness, the further is the horizon of our exploration and the greater is our capacity for exploration. Wow. And now you can see the connection between uh, polymathy and polymath with this kind of creativity. So polymathy is the evolutionary trajectory of human intelligence when it is being freed, liberated <laughs> from the cultural and social impositions, program, programmings and conditionings to become a specialist, to be, to be specialized. When our intelligence is free, natural curiosity, you know, will start to move us. And you can't be curious about one thing only in your life. Curious person become curious about almost everything. And when you are curious about something, when you study the something, since universe is interrelated, interconnected, and every subject has a connection, eventually you become interested in other subjects as well. So you can go multi to this, also single to multi. And this is the movement of our, you know, uh, curiosity and intelligence, yes? Yes. So polymatic intelligence that, you know, that will develop as we develop our spiritual intelligence evolve in the two complementary directions. One is the greater intellective, intuitive, imaginative and spiritual intelligence, obviously. The second is the multi-logical and trans-paradigmatic thought and multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary knowledge. And this polymathy, now this I want to, you know, especially uh, share this with uh, Angela. There's a concept called ontological flooding, which I will call ontological immersion. And I'll, I'll explain, yeah? So ontological immersion uh, has a two dimensions. You see, when we study many things, we can have one framework and study things and fit into our framework. That's one way of studying things, absolutely. Or you just set aside your own framework, a paradigm, and immerse yourself, not just intellectually, but ontological. You're being immerse yourself into a particular culture, particular subject, particular paradigm, and understand that paradigm, culture from within. So for example, you know, ancient shamans had a lot of interesting experiences. You can study about shamanism, you know, intellectually, or you actually join the shamans and do whatever they do to really absorb what they're doing and you have the same kind of a, you know, vision. Then you have the experience internally. So polymathic intelligence has a potential of having this uh, ontological immersion, which has, does two things. One, you immerse yourself in different kind of uh, culture, different kind of paradigm and understand it uh, from within, and having done that many times, you come back and integrate into a new, and create something new. So uh, polymathy goes beyond uh, epistemology and gnosiology, 
knowledge into actually ontology and being. And so spiritual intelligence makes it possible for polymath to become competent at this ontological immersion, which is what I mean by trans paradigmatic mind. You will have a different kind of experience and understanding of different subject in this way. And this is what I call also omnicentric consciousness. It, it is not just self-consciousness, it is self-consciousness, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and multi and trans at the same time. Um, there's a similarity to um, uh, Aurobindo's supermind because the, his supermind is like a bridge between the supramind and the inner mind. And you need to have the supermind level of flexibility, <laughs> so to speak, to be able to do this. Yeah. So you can not only connect with the divine, but you can also connect with different disciplines, different minds. Wonderful. Um, may I go ahead and try to summarize it in my own words? Can I say oh, one please. more? Thing? Well, once you're one, once you're done with the polymathy part, I would like to yeah, summarize it. I am, I, it yeah, I'm not, the polymathic spirituality. There's another dimension. Mm -hmm. So it is one dimension. Another dimension is this. So in India, we have a famous caste system. Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra, which was actually originally four dimensions of humans, human being, human consciousness. Brahmin dimension represent a philosopher, scholar, wisdom, knowledge. You can say Jnana, Jnana Yoga, mainly, of course, everything is in it, but the focus will be there. Kshatriya, warrior, leader, with courage, and leadership, Raja Yoga, Vaisha, producer of wealth and, and business and a businessman, whose job it is is to create wealth, mainly physical, but uh, you know, can be anything. Karma Yoga, Sudra, server, worker, service, royalty. Bhakti yoga. Each human being has all those four dimensions. And some in society, some people are more like a typology of humans, some people more on this side. I am very heavy on uh, Brahman and, uh, and uh, Kshatriya. I don't do very well with business. <laughs> and, you know, sure you can't, maybe the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> well, you, no, you're a good businessman as well, so you have everything maybe. But, but you see, we have all, all those four, but you know, there are some typologies. So, so you see, within yourself, you have all four and the society typology. There is no up and down. It is a four different dimensions of uh, humans and society. Polymatic spirituality. We, we regain this. We become polymath. We are Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaisha, and Sudra. And we do Jnana Yoga, Raja Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. And in 21st century, we need one more. I don't know the uh, Sanskrit word for this, but it is called the artist. The artist. In the way that Michelangelo was an artist, Da Vinci was artist, the artist. Maybe you can teach me, give me the Sanskrit word appropriate for this uh, artist. So who's a who creator and transformer? Whose virtue is beauty and creativity? 
the new Tantra Yoga. Mm-hmm. Artists, new Tantra Yoga. They will have uh, five yogas, five kinds of yogis within ourselves. So that is another polymatic spirituality. And being a polymath of the future, uh, if you read my essay, I suggested to read, you become Homo Deus, divine human, who is the integration of Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaisha, Sudra, and the artist, new kind of Renaissance man and woman, who is also the integration of Homo sapiens, Homo father, and Homo rudens, techno, art, scientist, philosopher. So those are the polymath, polymath and polymathic uh, spiritual, spirituality. Wow. Wow. So l- let, me, let me try to put it in my own words, uh, my, my own summary of um, my notes of it. So folks, this is actually a very profound idea. In the first section, we talked about spirituality and pointed to other things. What this section is doing is to make real that you have all these dimensions within you. You have your spirit, you have your intellect, you have your emotions, you have your heart, you have your physical body, you have the physical surroundings that you are working on. You have the society. All of these are real. And you need a strategy that envelopes all of it. So the ontological immersion is to immerse yourself in a physical context, immerse yourself. So starting at the physical context, intellectual context, which is very different from yours. You have to be prepared to do that in order to fully see the basis, both the physical, intellectual, psychological, spiritual basis of something that is other than you, other than what you currently have. And being able to access that at all those levels, it's critical to support your spirituality, to support your core. You can't do spirituality. This is not the view of spirit as opposed to matter. This is the integration of spirit with matter. This is very much, you know, in the tradition, in Western tradition, this is Aristotelian. This is not platonic. This is not separated out. This is all one thing intimately connected to each other. And any progress you make at any level actually supports all of it. And all of it is capped very beautifully by the description of the yogas and the four castes, which were originally focused on the capabilities that people had mm-hmm. and the, uh, you know, the, the strengths that people had instead of separating them out in people, you know, as people, you're saying that these are the faculties that you have. You have the capacity of working. You have the capacity of feeling love. You have the capacity of your mind and you have the capacity of focusing on what you need to do in spite of uh, all kinds of things. So bringing all of these together in us as human beings is what the yoga is about. We've been studying Bhagavad Gita. It is all about integration of these and how they support each other. So that's what um, uh, Yasuhiko is talking about as best as I can see. Go ahead, Yasuhiko. You always uh, language it much better than uh, I do. <laughs> no, but you, you, you're more, you're far more inspired. I, I'm just doing a summary of what you no, said. No, 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 I, I, I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> so now we want to talk about uh, autodidactism. And uh, let me uh, first lay out the four requirements to be a full-fledged autodidact. <laughs> One is to be an eternal student 
and two, to live in constant cosmic wonder, to be an eternal student and to live in constant cosmic wonder. The second requirement is to be a cosmic being first before and beyond being a social being. So who you are and the purpose of your life need to be understood in the cosmic sense and cosmic context first before the social sense and the social context. The second. The third one is to be a sovereign individual, self-initiative, self-causative, self-generative, and self-responsible individual. It's kind of obvious. <laughs> and last is to see and live your life as your primary artwork. Making an art of your own life every day. So those four, so go deeper into the each one. So being an eternal student, so being an autodidactic implies, being an autodidact implies that you be both Krishna, the teacher, the knowledge, and Arjuna, the student, the learner, not knowing. Being an autodidact means that you be an eternal student of life, nature, universe. So the inner Arjuna is an eternal quest, while the inner Krishna is in eternal attunement with the whole the known, the unknown, the unknowable. So Krishna is not only the divine, but it is an opening to the divine and the whole. And Arjuna is the eternal student who is in eternal quest for knowledge, wisdom, greater awareness and greater consciousness. The original Buddhist concept of evolution is the process of open-ended learning. I, I love that concept. So evolution is, as I said, is synonymous with exploration. The more evolved you are in consciousness, the further is the horizon of your exploration and the greater is your competency for exploration. So the evolution of consciousness requires that we be in a constant state of quest. We must remain free from our own insight, realizations and theories. When you have an aha experience, you become so impressed with it that you get stuck there. <laughs> So we should not be too impressed with and thereby stuck in our own realizations. Letting go of our realization, insight, knowledge is as important as attaining it. The spiritual awakening is a ceaseless process of light spreading and darkness despairing. So an eternal student always gaze at the unknown and at the boundary between the knowable and unknowable. All this means that you live in an eternal wonderment and real cosmic wonderment comes after the awakening of spiritual intelligence. So for autodidact, learning as such is the purpose of life, which means evolving as such is the purpose of life. Becoming, becoming, overcoming. That's 
what it means to be eternal student. And second is the knowing the purpose of life in the cosmic context. Context. This was actually uh, my original uh, insight when I was I had I was very young. Uh, I was asking what the purpose of my life and who am I. So the purpose of life is to be, <laughs> which is ongoingly fulfilled. And to be and to increasingly becoming you. So the purpose of life is to be and which means to be you. And being always is in the process of becoming. And you can only become what you are already. So, you know, you are becoming you and more and more. And this is a, in a cosmic sense. Each one of us is a unique monad. Singular monad. Singular cosmic destiny. So the purpose of your being is to actually unfold this singularity into its po greatest pos possible evolution. So the purpose of life is being, and it means that there is a being is attained in every passing moment of becoming. And if you are being authentic, you increasingly become the authentic you. And in your becoming, you become the process itself of your authentic evolutionary unfolding, unfoldment, self-transformation, self-overcoming, self-evolution. Whereas the people in general, go to school to become somebody in society and acquire knowledge and expertise, attain a certain position and status in society. That's why I said, you need to be a cosmic being first before you being a social being. And society is not interested in your cosmic being and cosmic destiny. Society is interested in itself and how, how to fit you there. So people forget the cosmic dimension of their existence and exclusively focus on the social dimension, forgetting their cosmic self, their Atman. So the autodidacts acquire knowledge and expertise as an expression of becoming who they are authentically of fulfilling their own purpose and destiny independent of society and their status therein. As evolution is an open-ended process of becoming, and I'm sorry, learning, your evolutionary self-unfolding involves ceaseless becoming and learning. So for you and me, an autodidact. Learning, evolving, is the end unto itself. Now, um, should you can't introduce me to the work of uh, Louis Sargon, the connection between function and form. So when you see so the form ever follows function, yes? That is his famous statement. It's very profound, very, very profound. You can write a whole book just based on this one sentence. It contains so much. Actually, it contains the whole universe, actually, in one, one sentence. So your function in the universe, cosmic, your cosmic function in the universe is learning.
your function is that being a unique learner, singular, cosmic learner, and your form of your life, your manifest life is the form that ever follows that function. Whosoever you become in society, people may say, oh, you're a professor, you're a writer, you're this and this. But actually, it is actually the, the form coming from your function. Shrikant is a eternal student, polymatic, autodidactic, and how your life shows up as a form is 52 living ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, this is an expression of his cosmic function. Yes. And you see, when and people, so when you go to school and you, you, you become somebody in society, they pursue, they try to find a function in society. I become a teacher. I become a musician, whatever. I become businessman. And they become, their life evolves around that function. The form you see is based on the function they choose in society. But if your function is incongruent, if your social function is incongruent with your cosmic function, for which you are naturally designed, you will have, you will experience suffering, frustration, dissatisfaction, unfulfillment. So no matter what function you choose in society, being a cosmic learner, learning has to be part of it, yes? yes. But then somebody whose uh, cosmic function is more, the, more in the direction of being an artist, working at the office, nine to five would be extremely frustrating. So it is important for somebody who, uh, who are an autodidact. Actually, every human being has a you know, potential. want to see himself in the context, himself or herself in the context of the universe and context of the cosmic function, which is a unique learner, unique evolver. And construct his or her life in such a way that the function is fulfilled and the form that follows in life correspond to that function. And that is a program many polymaths have. have. They are multi-talented. They're naturally they're interested in so many different things and good at so many different things. But society forced them to become a specialist. And somehow their unique capability is frustrated. And their cosmic destiny truncated. Yes, Rico, let me make yeah. a quick comment here uh, because yeah. Louis Sullivan has a brilliant idea that captures this issue. Mm -hmm. He calls it the inverted self. Mm -hmm. He says what happens is that it is natural that we focus on function and create forms. Mm -hmm. Inverted self is somebody who takes whatever the society around them, whatever forms that are there around them as given, 
and tries to accommodate their function. So they let the forms actually rule the function. And that is the inverted self. That is the exactly opposite of the causality. That's and that beautiful. is deadly. That is deadly because yes. it actually kills the function. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. I like that. Yeah. I should read uh, his entire book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The third element is being a sovereign individual, sovereign individuality. And the being sovereign means to be at cause, being the cause of your own life. And every human, the cause is a function and the form is an effect. You can say that there's that kind of relationship. Not exactly the same, but you can map into the same, same yep. format. And human beings live in the realm of and on the level of effect. So the best they can be is being effective, never being causative. And you, you get uh, validation uh, and accolade for being effective. You don't get the validation and accolade for being causative. So being at cause is an essence of being an independent, sovereign a human being. And it is also a one definition of freedom. Freedom is the state of being at cause and the process of becoming as cause, which is function. So the cause is the active force that is unmanifest. Cause is super sensible and super perceptible. Whereas effect is sensible and uh, perceptible, obviously. And the effect is a reactive. Science studies at this moment, science studies only effect. So being Sovereign individual, the, aware, the kind of awareness that is present when you are being at cause. Buddhists called, Tibetan Buddhists called Yeshe, which means original awareness. It is an active awareness that originates. Different from kind of consciousness we talk about, which consciousness is aware of only effect. But this original awareness is actually causal. You are the origin of creation and you are aware of it. So that's the third element of being autodidact, being sovereign individual. And last element is uh, to be, uh, to, to see and live your life as a primary form of art, your, your art. And the freedom is also the state of awareness of the whole, yes? You, when you, you are at the, uh, have the original awareness, what is you are aware of is the whole. You are moving with the whole together, uh, together with it. it is, you are at one with the Tao. There you behold beauty and you are beheld by beauty at the level of a causation. So being a, an autodidact and sovereign individual and polymatic, your inner artist become awakened and begin to have a greater and greater vision for beauty. So in freedom and in an evolving way, your vision of beauty deepens and expands. So your sense of beauty and your aesthetics evolves. And through this, you start to make your life a piece of art. You want to live beautiful life, <laughs> so to speak.
So this is, uh, to me, four requirements or four dimensions of what it means to be autodidact. And so autodidactic polymatic spirituality is to be an autodidact and free yourself, your intelligence and develop more and more into spiritual intelligence through which you have an encounter with the divine. And that is so essential for today and for tomorrow. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Yasuhiko. Um, let's, uh, shall we take some questions? Folks, uh, now we're going to take questions. Try to keep your questions concise so we can get to as many questions as possible. We'll start with uh, Evanik. Uh, go ahead. Uh, can we take just uh, one minute break? Sure, absolutely. So uh, while, while we're doing that, I'm going to summarize, um, summarize what uh, Yasuhiko just said about autodidact. He's saying there are four things. The first one is that you have to be an eternal student. Arjun is a classic example. And you're kind of going between being Arjun and being Krishna at the same time. Um, number two, that you are a cosmic being before a social being. That your spirit, standing in your spirit is what allows you to be a good social being. If you try to make social being the primary, you have the inverted self where you are actually going to destroy yourself and actually others. If you just try to follow whatever it is that the society is telling you. The third one is this concept of being at cause. You focus, focus on the cause, focus on the function, not the effect. And the last one is going to, is living as an artist. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark to ask questions. At this point, we will just take questions. At the, at the end, I'm gonna give uh, time for comments, okay? So let's, let's try to keep the questions brief. We're gonna start with Evanique followed by Angela. Um, go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to ask questions. Shri can do you want me to wait for yeah, yeah let, let's wait for okay. uh yes so you could come back and uh all right let's begin we uh give me just a second uh evanik go ahead evanik followed by uh angela followed by cheng go ahead uh, yes hi yes thank you so much for the hello. presentation hello hi i think you might have already answered it but um i'll ask it anyway how do you become a generator of ideas rather than a consumer? Number one, uh, you want to pay attention to the questions that are arising within your awareness. And uh, you want to really pay attention to the questions that you have, which also uh, another aspect of it is uh, pay attention to what you don't know. And you know, uh, Pedro Spitsky says, actually he begins with the sentence, his magnum opus. The most difficult thing in life is to know what we know and to know what we don't know. <laughs> and we need to have a keen awareness of what we know and what we don't know. So when you start to pay attention to the questions you, you, are, you are asking, you also become aware, increasingly aware of this, what you don't know in contradistinction to what you know. And we begin to realize that, you know, uh, we actually know very little, <laughs> relative to what can be known. <laughs> and there are very few things, you know, we can, I mean, in my case anyway, I can say, I know, 
<laughs> and but also this knowledge is more like a spectrum. There's an absolute certainty and absolute uncertainty. Our knowledge is somewhere in between. Some things that we are much less certain than others, but you go this way. There are a few things you can say, I know absolutely, most of them are in this area. And you want to really pay attention to this. And then, so cherish the questions. And then you begin to you know, uh, uh, answer those questions yourself. Yourself. You must make an effort to answer the question yourself. You know, uh, one of the reasons I chose uh, Zen as uh, my uh, spiritual path originally when I was young is because Zen is not based on answers. It's based on questions. And it is based on inquiry, not based on beliefs or theories. So when you go to, uh, uh, you ask questions to your Zen master, he, he would ask you a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's rare that the Zen master actually answers the question. But when you answer the question, it, it is wrong answer, he said no. <laughs> so obviously he knows the answer, but he never give you the answer. <laughs> so that is, uh, you know, so you want to see yourself, your life as an ongoing process of learning and ongoing eternal quest and always always value what your uh, questions and one important question you want to ask is what is the question that i am not asking <laughs> that can make, transform my life wonderful thank you next up is going to be angela Jang, Jyoti, Jeff, and Laura. Angela, go ahead. Hi, Yasuhiko. Hi, Angela. Hi, good to see you. Good to um, see you. So, so you're talking about autodidactic polymathic spirituality, which I love. Um, what role do you think bravery plays in someone's ability to actually become autodidactic, polymathic, and spiritual, and to make their own life a unique artistic expression of their own essence. What role does bravery play in that? So uh, courage, what you call bravery, uh, is, as C.S. Lewis said, at the foundation of all moral virtues. Because when you, uh, practice, when you exercise, when you express, when you live any virtue, you need the courage to do it. So courage is essential. Now, courage is not, of course, absence of fear. It is a mastery of fear, as people say, which is correct. So fear, you will start to have a different relationship with fear when you begin to have courage. When you begin to move into the direction of affirmation as opposed to negation, you see, fear is an emotion that arises when you say no to reality. So there's a element, there is a excitement. When you say no to that excitement, it becomes fear. And so to begin, you need some courage to begin with, but <laughs> you begin to affirm. The first thing you affirm is your own fear. You stop saying no to your fear. Fear is there. And so as part of your affirming reality as it is, you affirm that you have fear. The more you affirm it, the less fear you have. 
because the existence of your, the ground of your being become affirmation as opposed to negation. And the person who, whose ground of being is affirmation cease to have so-called fear. Wonderful. Um, I just want to let you know, folks, that we are doing an entire meetup on the virtue of courage. This is based on my reading of uh, 103 Great Ideas. Um, this is, uh, you know, great books. This is basically compiling all the questions people have asked throughout history, whether philosophers, novelists, scientists, economists, historians, they have asked about courage. So I list all the, we are going to list all the questions that have been asked, and we're going to look at all the answers that have been given. And then we're going to have a discussion. So the kinds of questions will be, this is going to be this Thursday at 9 p.m. What is the nature of courage? What role does courage play in human life? How is courage related to other virtues? What motivates courage? Is it honor, love, happiness, duty, faith? What training and practice builds courage? What is the political and civil significance of courage? So that's what we're going to do on Thursday at uh, 9 p.m. Uh, this is, by the way, I started these meetups, uh, Yasuhiko, as 103 Great Ideas meetups to discuss. We've gone through 50 of those ideas. So this is something that I've done in the past. It's just, just beautiful to have sure. the entire uh, kind of context of uh, Western civilization and look at questions in that way. All right, uh, next up is going to be Jeng, Jyoti, Jeff, and Laura. Jeng. Hi, uh, yes, Siku. I really like what you said about spirituality. We have a lot of discussion on that and the future of what we do with all the you know, different religion, spirituality. And I really like your proposal. And I see that my question is, it seems, is based on individual awakening, which it seems we are far away from it. <laughs> the people who are even interested in awakening, which most people here are not common. And the people who are looking for it, doesn't mean they are already awakened. So I just see, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I see, especially with education, my kids, you mentioned when they need to figure out the cosmos of self before they become a social self. What I see in education is only focus on social self. Mm -hmm. There's no space for them to develop. And if we go to church, maybe they have opportunity to do that, maybe not. But it seems there's not a structure for use to have the opportunity, a systematic way to grow that or develop that. That's why actually I was trying to start this creative group with a friend in Seattle and maybe contact you on that too. And I think, how can we build this system? You know, it needs some kind of system. The Americans so great the Olympic swim because they have a system of swimming. So that's why they have all this tier. That's why we, we always win the swimming competition. But how do we build the spiritual growth system? I think that's very critical to make it happen. You know, otherwise, you know, I don't know. I don't see, I see, I want to hear what you're thinking. Well, uh... Because we have this internet, uh, we don't need to be uh, stuck with a particular physical location. At the same time, you know, uh, uh, physical location is important. So in both ways, we can develop a community. Let's talk about the internet first. So now we have uh, 21, 22 people in, on this uh, call, 20, 21 people. And let's say, you know, we want to actually create a community, uh, learning community uh, where people involved together uh, evolve and make impact on the others. And so you, let's say you, I don't know your personal life. Uh, if you're married, you have a husband and kids then uh, your kids go to school. So there are other mothers and uh, other fathers and other kids. We want to, uh, you need to see 
who are the who are the mothers or fathers who are actually open to this idea of creating a spiritual learning community and if you want to take initiative you want to develop that and you come back to the uh, this online group and you get the support from this online group so you use the online group and then your local community and they both necessary now few things number one uh in my view uh baby boomers and uh, all the way to uh generation x or even y not too much hope <laughs> you know people don't change easily and you cannot make people change you cannot make people aware and people who have that you know opening it was in themselves somehow they have, they find a way to wake up and so there are awake people there are asri people there are some people in between but in in between people there are two different directions they want to sleep more or they want to awake more okay and you want to achieve approach <laughs> this <laughs> and uh, i think what we need to do is to create this kind of community online and local together outside of the system that exists today alternative system global and local interlinked community of spiritual polymatic autodidactic community and uh, i think the home you know, home schooling is excellent for kids but you need to also uh, educate the parents so you know uh, personally uh, we want to approach young people who, who are getting married <laughs> start a family we want to involve them in your local community and uh, you see learning and ec education is a whole community affair so the online we we learn together and locally you learn together which means parents and kids and even teachers if they are open so information is available resources are available now you know uh, if you are interested in doing this you want to take initiative wonderful um cheng Brilliant question. Just love, love your question. I know that this is very close to your heart. You've been talking about this for years. So, um, so wonderful. We'll, we'll, you can uh, initiate, uh, you know, uh, online group first. Absolutely. I, I mean, I can, what I can do is very simply is we can do like a local version of uh, 52 living ideas in Seattle. And uh, we'll, we, you know, th th I'm planning to do that in New York um, and in any place. So, uh, you know, let, let, let's let's talk. I think there is a lot that can be done because actually the resources that we are producing online, like for example, this conversation is very, very useful. And you can just take it to a local group and say, okay, what does this mean to us? Uh, in whatever group you have, whatever, uh, you know, so, and, and you can feed that back into the online. So uh, the, the point that Yasuiko was making about that we are living in an incredible world where actually many things are possible which were just not possible even like 10 years ago or, or, or 20 years ago. So thank you. Next up is going to be Jyoti, Jeff, Laura, and Alice. Jyoti, go ahead. Well, my question is similar to Jan, Jens. Um, and I thought I wrote that here. We, how do you manifest your indiv individual spirituality that you have learned in your life onto the social fabric of the society? And that's exactly what she's asking. And that is my frustration also. Mm -hmm. I, um, I am actually a community person and there are people of my age, younger people and very young people 
And if I bring that idea about spirituality, they confuse it with religious. Oh, we are not from this, we are not Hindus. We are not uh, whatever, Buddhists or whatever. It is not, spirituality is not about religion. And it's the whole, this idea is so far-fetched for them that I, you know, I had to take a back seat because I'm the only one. And no, I wouldn't say I'm the only one. There are a lot of people of my age group in America, just like in 52 Ideas, who are in league with me, who do understand. But again, we are far and few. So you could fulfill yourself, but then when you go outside your home, four doors, four walls, you are very frustrated because people are not buying into it. And uh, just like Jen, she has younger children, I have older children. And they meet with the same brick wall. So, you know, it is very frustrating for people like us, but I'm, it's not very, very frustrating for people like me also, because I'm at the stage of my life where this is more important to me, how I view myself and how, how I want to navigate my path in the future. So I'm okay with that too. So that's my question and answer at the same time. Thank you. Well, uh, well, yeah, question and answer at the same time. You know, um, so um, in the last uh, like 20 some years, um, I consulted businesses and I also organized courses. And uh, I charged them good money, not online course I'm doing, but you know, the actual courses I have done or consulting. And uh, people who have the commitment to learn, they are willing to pay for it. So sometimes, you know, you, you, know, you have worth of knowledge uh, in your life. You can actually uh, meet people who are interested in this by actually organizing courses anywhere you know you can do uh, if you can do uh, in person is better online is very limited in my view at least in the kind of work i do uh, is very limited but uh, and then you know actually you charge them don't give them for free not because you know you're greedy or anything you know that's a pre-select who is willing to actually do it? <laughs> and uh, I don't do it anymore, but you know, in the past I did uh, you know, one year course, two year course, three year course, uh, uh, Ambika was in one of those. And uh, one course was $8,000 a year. It went against anything people think about spiritual program. You're charging $8,000, you can, I can, Take a one-year course in Harvard University. Okay, that's fine. You go to Harvard. I don't care. And some, and then of course there are people. I can see some people who are real commitment, but you know they don't have the money. In which case, of course I make an exception. It is not the money. It is their their, their willingness to do it. So money is an interesting thing. People spend money on things that they they have the commitment. So if you want to share your knowledge, you can organize something like courses and then you know, invite people. It can be $50 a night, that's okay. People will pay $50 if they're interested in what you have to say. Uh, next question is going to be by uh, Jeff, Laura and Alice. Let's uh, keep the questions brief. So we can get through all the questions. Uh, Jeff. Thank you again for a wonderful um, session here. So, um, you know, I, I, I deeply resonate with being an eternal student uh, to live in constant wonder, always focusing on the next frontier, um, just like the frontier behind me here. Um, and, I, and this, this moving be, between what we think we know, what we think we don't know and encountering things that we we didn't know, we didn't know. Um, I, I resonate with, with cherishing better and better questions, but I find myself often 
encountering um, and being in situations with folks who deeply cherish their conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, in <laughs> fact, it would be it would it would almost be a uh, an insult to suggest to them that they might wish to put current in front of the word conclusions or even tentative in the front of in front of the word conclusions. And I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for how to have conversations that might really prize questions over conclusions. Um, number of years ago, uh, I read in a book, uh, and this Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist uh, was interviewed. And the interviewer asked him, who was the greatest influence on your becoming, you know, great scientist and Nobel Prize winning scientist? And he says, my mother. I said, was your mother a scientist? No. So in what way did your mother influenced you? Uh, and he said, so every day he took me, uh, she, she took me to school and uh, she asked me what, uh, one, one thing ask good questions. And when she picked me up, she asked me, what question did you ask today? And every day of uh, his growing up, and uh, mother paid no attention to whether or not uh, he got good grade. She paid attention to the question he asked. And then, I share the story to people. <laughs> well, that's interesting. And all the great scientists, you know, you read, they say something similar. You know, my favorite one is uh, Richard Feynman. You know, he asked, he, all his life, he was more interested in the question. He said, uh, I am more interested in the question that can be, can be answered than the answer that can be questioned. <laughs> So, you know, giving some example of those people who achieved the pinnacle of intellectual, uh, you know, uh, achievement, they may, at least they may open up, you know, stories, you know, you know instead of uh, convincing them, they say, oh, interesting. Don't, so if you, you can say, well, you may be interested in uh, your conclusions, and I, I don't argue with the conclusion, but what about your kids? Don't you want your, your kids to become... Nobel Prize winning scientist. If that's the case, do this. <laughs> Something like that. Um, next up is going to be um, Alice followed by Ambika. Alice. Hi, I wrote it down so I could try to be fast. I guess I'm an oddball. This is one of the only meetups that I really like. Um, uh, so I'm already, I'm very intuitive. Um, I have dreams, um, getting answers. I'll wake up with a... Uh, answers and I have a relative amount of freedom. I'm not over, I'm not really intellectual though, uh, but I guess I might have the answer. This might be a Krishna Arjuna or time and space question uh, because I feel like this pressure, um, my purpose or whatever in this lifetime, um, but um, it's kind of like, uh, what if uh, you don't accomplish fully all of these great things that you're talking about within this lifetime? And is this a loss of time and pressure or is it just constantly expanding even when you pass away? Um, so am I looking forward to hopes or am I looking forward to, I guess, a failed mission? <laughs> First of all, if your mission is to learn and to evolve and to create, you know, your mission is fulfilled on, at every moment of your life. Number two, uh, infinite, the infinite can never be fulfilled in the time and space that is finite. So you and I will die in the middle of the project, not having done everything that we could have done. And that is fine with me. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, now. Last question is going to be by Ambika. And then I think 
Uh, Angela has a comment about polymathy and spirituality. So we can do uh, Angela's comment and then um, then Yasuhiko's um, comment on that. Uh, so let's go with uh, Ambika next. Yeah, Suhiko, firstly, thank you so much for an exquisitely beautiful, magnificent presentation. I feel it in my whole being, as you know. Um, and what I want to ask is, given that all shades of human expressions coexist at all times and that weave, how would people in this, in this evolving community and in its manifestation deal with the issue of evil? Evil. 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 Okay, you know, uh, evil is a concept that has been invented by the evil people. <laughs> <laughs> good people have two distinctions, good and bad. <laughs> and evil people call us good people evil <laughs> and themselves uh, good. Have you noticed that? Mm. <laughs> so, um, although I have used the word good, good and evil in the past, and I continue to use it, but, you know, uh, we want to be careful in using this term and don't fall into their distinctions, but use the word in our own distinctions. So if there's a good and bad, number one. And uh, so what is good? Good is that which is conducive to evolution. And bad is that which is uh, inconducive to evolution, individually and together. And uh, you see, Bhagavad Gita is unique in many ways, but one is it deals with the actual battle in the battlefield of good and evil, the responsibles and the resentfuls. <laughs> yeah. And what happened up to this moment is that evil people are relentless and ruthless. Mm -hmm. So they have no compunction about killing others. They, can, they have killed people by the millions and they have no compunction whatsoever. Yep. And good people, especially spiritually correct people, <laughs> they go into loving kindness and compassion, this and this and this and this, and they do not want to be ruthless and relentless. Also they, oh, I, I forgive this and this. And as a result, evil took over the world. And Krishna, the teaching is really variable. And Arjuna, the side of Arjuna actually win the war in that particular one, yes? And Krishna encouraged Arjuna to do it. And to me, of all the spiritual literatures, Bhagavad Gita may be the best in teaching people how to deal with the evil, within and without. And you need to be as ruthless <laughs> and relentless as the evil people. And you need to be willing to kill them. <laughs> That's why Brahman need to be combined with Brahmin need to be combined with the Kshatriya. You need to be a priest warrior, philosopher warrior. Spiritually correct, politically correct, compassionate people they become the servant of the evil. Really. And it is a false compassion. False goodness. It is weak. 
It is fear-based. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yasuhiko. Uh, now, uh, Yasuhiko, uh, yeah, Angela had a comment on polymathy and spirituality. So, um, Angela, uh, please go ahead. And then um, we, we, we are running out of time. So maybe about three minutes. Is that Does that work? Oh, sure. That's plenty. Okay. Thank you. Um, this has been so wonderful, Yasuhiko. I love this stuff. And by the way, probably most of you watching this have no idea, but I've known Yasuhiko for... I don't know, it's probably getting close to 10 years and took many classes with him. He's been a spiritual mentor to me. And I also write, wrote my doctoral dissertation on polymathy. So this subject hits very close to home for me. Um, I basically am dedicating my entire life to, to spreading awareness for polymathy. And, and I love connecting it now to spirituality as I consider myself a very spiritual person. Um, and when I think about like, what are we here to do? If, if it's true that we are spiritual beings here having human experiences, like if you buy that, then what is the point of this? What is the point of being a human being on planet earth in 2022 <laughs> or at any time really? And for me, the answer I, I come up with when I ask myself that question is that we are here to learn, explore, have the human experience as fully and as deeply as we can we're here to express our authentic essence. And for me, the way you do that is through polymathy. Polymathy means many learnings. It's basically being a Renaissance person. It's freeing yourself from the cage of specialization and the expectations of society so that you can be you. And yes, you can make your life artistic expression. But I would add to even more than just an artistic expression, because that makes it sound so calm and beautiful and wonderful. <laughs> I would say that life as a polymath is an adventure um, and you become an explorer of, of the human experience. And that may mean even having difficult experiences and embracing that difficulty so that you can learn. If you want to be free, if you want to be yourself, exploring, uh, you know, different ways of learning is part of the journey. And it's also re-becoming yourself over and over again, which can be scary because it's safe to find an identity and stick with it. It's known. People know you as that. It's predictable. It takes courage. And that's why I asked the question about courage. It takes courage not only to explore what you don't know because you don't know what you'll find and that can be scary. It really takes courage also to let yourself change and evolve and become a new version of you. But that's what living is. That's what being free is in my view, is letting yourself change. So on a practical level, I just wanna encourage anyone watching this to be open to life as it comes to you. Be open-minded, be open to what you don't know, be open to changing your mind and your opinions and your identity even. Let life change you. Let life take you on a journey and, and be, be courageous about it. So hopefully something I said there was useful to somebody. Um, and I encourage you to, you know, live life as an adventurer, as an explorer and an artist. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, Yasuhiko. Yes. Uh, any comments, Angela, any thoughts? Uh, Go ahead. One of the things that Angela said is very important. You know, uh, so we are here to experience human experience. <laughs> it's a kind of tautology, but it is the case. And you know, uh, the all spirituality, at least misunderstood version of it, denies many aspects of human experience in order to achieve uh, spiritual enlightenment. And uh, it is important for us to really fully experience everything that is uh, available for human to experience. If you enter any experience with your awareness, it is spiritual. And some experience you, you cannot enter because that is not something that you, know, uh, you, you are designed to do. Killing people, for example. <laughs> so this, Full affirmation, full embracement of life, human life, 
as such is very important aspect of new, new spirituality. And uh, well, Andrea asked a fundamental question about life. Why question? And uh, you know, uh, people, maybe everybody in this group, I don't know, uh, when you have so-called uh, spiritual experience, you really get it, you have this experience of divine. There is no other word to actually, you know, convey this to people, the divinity. And there is really, there is a kind of a consciousness, awareness that embraces this infinity. And from there, we begin to see that in a way, the divine or the universe is the universe is the divinity's uh, experiment in evolving consciousness in form. And humans are one kind of forms. And it's possible when you look at the whole infinity of universes, there are different forms that are evolving consciousness in different form. And uh, when we begin to think about something like this, it's really like a majestic. And I always go back when meditate and being alone, I go back to this, the sense of immensity that arises with the experience of divinity. That immensity contains infinity, eternity, and beauty. And it is possible for everyone if we just open our mind and consciousness to that which is beyond us. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasuhiko. This was amazing, amazing. And I look forward to our monthly conversations. Thank you, everybody. Uh, great questions. Really appreciate you being here. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.